Welcome to the Fearless Family Health Podcast. In a world that is filled with fear, my hope is to bring you inspiration, information, and support to live joyfully and more healthfully. Join me as each week I will bring you empowering tips as well as interviews with parents, doctors, and experts to bring you vital information to make you the master of your family's future. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Fearless Family Health. Today, I am super excited to have a wonderful woman, an amazing mom, and a dear friend of mine, Christina Turner, come and share her story about having a child that was born intersex and the struggles she had not only figuring out how to support her child, but finding information and really becoming an advocate for her child and their body autonomy, and their rights. Christina Turner was raised in Katy, Texas, moved to the Pacific Northwest as a teenager. Christina and her family live just outside Seattle, Washington, and love exploring the beautiful region they live in and are active in their community. Christina is a person that wears many hats. She is a massage therapist, having completed an extensive two-year registered massage therapy program in British Columbia, Canada. She homeschools her three children. She devotes time to intersex activism and education and is an inspiring writer. Christina also has training in ethics and nonviolent communication. One of Christina's children is intersex, and upon finding out this information, she did extensive research before meeting with doctors and being faced with major decisions. Christina has been an advocate for her child's bodily autonomy from the beginning, and that has led her to be an activist for all intersex children and adults. Over the last couple of years, Christina has worked on educating her community through public speaking and formal presentations. Christina and Ori, her child, have spoken to family practice residents at Swedish Medical Center, a group of local midwives, and a parent advisory council and school superintendent. They have done interviews with Mick and NBC about intersex children's human rights. In March of 2018, they even gave a TEDx talk at the Western Washington University in Bellingham, Washington, titled Intersex is Awesome. So without further ado, I am here to introduce you to Christina Turner. Hey, Christina. I am so happy to have you on this podcast. I have known you for many, many years, and I am... So happy that I can come on and let you tell your story with what um, your life with Ori, the amazing, wonderful Ori that we all know. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about your journey in having a child who was born intersex and what that was like for you at the beginning, um, what kind of fears you had. And let's just go from there. What what was the beginning? Tell me the beginning story. Well, first, I want to say thank you for having me on. Um, And yeah, we have known each other, gosh, I think it's over 12 years now, um, in a friendship sense and as my chiropractor. Um, (laughs) So if I was to begin with my story with parenting Ori, um, I had Ori at the Bellingham Birth Center, which is where I had all of my kiddos. Um, and I had them with midwife assistance, um, but no, I was lucky I didn't need any medical intervention and had happy, healthy birth experiences. Um, so Ori was born as my um, biggest babe at nine pounds, one ounce. <laughs> they were pretty giant <laughs> um, and big and strong. And um, anyways, when they were born, I... It was it was sort of strange, but during labor, like as I was delivering them, I said, it's a boy. And it was sort of just like an instinctual thing. I didn't even, I'm sure anyone who's had a child can relate to this. I didn't even think about saying that. Um, and then the midwives were like, oh, no, it's a girl. And I was like, oh, are you sure? And it was sort of this funny moment between my husband and I and the midwives. And they were like, oh, no, we're sure it's a girl. And so they handed me my healthy baby girl. And, and we named Ori, Oriana. Um, and I immediately noticed that there was, you know, something a little different about her and or them. <laughs> um, that they had 
some genital swelling. And I asked the midwife because my oldest daughter hadn't had that. And they immediately reassured me that that it's a normal process of birth sometimes, especially with bigger babies, and that they weren't worried at all and it should go down in no time. Um, so then over a period of a few weeks, it didn't go down. And I went to a couple different doctors because my doctor didn't, he, he was like, you know, try cloth diapers and he didn't really know. So after a couple different opinions, we finally got to a pediatrician that, that knew that it wasn't, you know, some diaper rash or something. Um, and at this point, Ori was seven weeks old. So by then, Josh and I were already pretty worried that Ori may have, you know, cancer or that this could be something serious, even though they seemed healthy um, because the swelling wasn't going away. So when we saw this final doctor and he said, um, you know, I think your child has ambiguous genitalia. Don't worry. They know who they are inside. Um, it was sort of a relieving moment rather than a scary moment because we had already been going to such a scarier place in our or in my mind I guess um thinking that it was something severe so to hear that was reassuring because it was like okay they're not sick so this is manageable um and I was lucky in the way that I had lived in Seattle before I had kids and I was an avid reader of the underground newspapers and stuff there like the stranger and I had read Dan Savage had a sex advice column and I had read once somebody writing in who had an intersex condition or intersex variation. And, um, Dan Savage had mentioned that surgeries happened to these kids and, you know, that he, he was giving this person advice and apologizing to them for the trauma they had endured. And I think I was only like 19 at the time I read that, but when I was 24 and I was getting this news about Ori, it like, you know, clicked with me that I had heard of this before, that it wasn't totally foreign to me. Um, so that doctor, you know, sent us on our way and we were going to go to Children's Hospital the next week. And so we had like a weekend to research. And so I, I drew myself into immense research and um, I had a lot of fears surrounding the medical community and how Ori would be treated because a lot of my research showed that intersex people had um, been ostracized and treated as medical experiments and had just had a lot, had had a lot of sick experiences. It, there was, there was no positive stories that I was finding. Uh -huh. um, and at this time in 2007, you know, luckily the age of the internet we all live in, I was able to find a lot of information. I can't imagine if I had just been going to a library, being able to find all this information. Yeah. Um, and my main fears, if I was to isolate them, would be, you know, there was all a lot of literature on cancer risk. So I wanted to make sure I found out what that cancer risk was for Ori. Um, and that was obviously a top one. But right up there with that was my fears and anxieties over doctors wanting to pressure me on surgeries that would be cosmetic, doctors wanting to pressure me on medical tests that weren't necessary you know I was definitely afraid I knew from reading what kind of things could be thrown at me I was really optimistic naively so um, thinking that since we lived in the Pacific Northwest and we had access to Seattle and all these West Coast doctors that you know it was going to be really progressive um, and that definitely wasn't our experience we didn't have a wonderful experience our first couple times at Children's um, and so those fears were founded, I guess. But luckily, because I was able to educate myself, and I had a lot of research, um, I felt confident in protecting like Ori's autonomy. Um, and I was also really lucky because it, the ISNA, the Intersex Society of North America, they had a website, which uh, Jan Savage had also mentioned in that article, funny enough. Um, and they weren't active at the time. But uh, the the website like people still answered the emails and connected you to people and the website still had a ton of information which it's still up even though the organization is no longer alive um <clears throat> so through that i was able to contact a person named jane goto who um is a wonderful friend of ours now uh, years later and uh she met me at children met josh and i at children's hospital after ori's appointment <clears throat> the very first time so um i really feel like you know Jane and Isna and being able to arm myself with all this information helped settle my fears um but I definitely had a lot of fears 
initially just over like health and making yeah. medical decisions that whether or not they were necessary to make. Um, I didn't have all those other fears that come later, like, will they fall in love and, you know, all that other kind of stuff that comes as your kiddo ages. Yeah. Um, but my initial fears were all around the, the medical uh, world and making sure that Ori didn't have an ill relationship either with doctors. I think that was really tough for me because I know that at some point we may all need Western medicine and we need that balance in our life of natural and modern medicine. And I didn't want Ori to have negative experiences that would develop into anxieties and fears and distrust over um, doctors. Yeah. And I remember, cause I, I knew you when Ori was born. Cause I'll, how old is Ori now? 11 and a half. They're, they'll be 12 in March. Yeah. So I probably known you a little bit longer than 12 years then. Cause I knew, I knew you when you were pregnant with Ori and when Ori was born. And I remember that you were coming in as a client then, and you had been down to the hospital and um, were concerned. Cause they, I think they were suggesting and not, I don't know if pushing is the word, but um recommending surgery on Ori and you did not feel that was where you wanted to go, but you had some fears around that. Yeah. I mean, um, like with intersex variations, there's a lot of different types. There's over 40 different variations. So with the type that Ori has, they had, um, they have testes. Um, so, we don't know for sure if that's testicular or ovarian tissue because we've never biopsied it. But um, I had fears surrounding, the only fear I had surrounding not doing surgery was that if I left Ori's testes in place, was that going to affect their psyche or, you know, confuse them or things like that? And these were obviously thoughts I had, you know, like you're saying, 12, 11 and a half years ago um, or 11 years ago. So at that time, too, I didn't really understand gender and science and the brain as much as I do now. Now, I would never have those fears um, because I know that it, a lot of the effect has happened in utero of your gender and your psyche and um, how you feel about yourself. Um, but anyways, at that time, that was my only fear with not doing surgery and obviously the cancer risk. But because Ori's, um, where Ori's testes are positioned in their body, they're not buried within the heat, heat of the abdomen. <clears throat> so that cancer risk is actually very, very minimal for them. And I found from, you know, communicating more with intersex people through their communities and doctors who would specialize more in these fields, that that cancer risk itself is very, very minimal. And a lot of times, I think the only statistical situations they've had where they found cancer was in older people whose testes had been in their abdomen for, you know, 40, 50 years, um, exposed to the heat and had caused um, changes in the, in the genetics of it so um which I'm not saying right at all <laughs> changes in some in malignancy or whatever um yeah. so I knew Ori wasn't as, as as at risk of those things but yeah we were pressured to do surgery we were even told that there was previous patients of this doctor that hated their parents for not doing surgery um we were also uh, they wanted to do a test <clears throat> where they would inject ink into Ori's genitalia and reproductive system so that they could look at that under a you know special x-ray and blah 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 and I basically denied everything like I was like you know we can do blood tests we can do chromosome analysis hormone analysis we're not doing anything that isn't necessary and I especially was uncomfortable with the ink test that they wanted to do because part of the requirement of that procedure was that Ori would have to go under anesthesia because they were a seven week old infant or an eight week old infant when they had asked to do that. And they would need, you know, them to not squirm and stuff. And I was basically shocked. Why would I want to put a healthy infant under anesthesia? We all know that anesthesia carries risks, especially with infants and children. Um, so I was, I was sort of almost laughing at them like, no, why would I? No, <laughs> we're not doing anything that's going to put my child at risk in any way because they're perfectly healthy. Yeah. And it um, like so it, it was... It, it sounds like just more for curiosity. I mean, there was didn't seem to be any health issues that they needed to do this. Yeah. Well, that was exactly my feelings as well, is that this was more for morbid curiosity 
to put in their charting or whatever. And I actually did say to them, you know, Ori is urinating and defecating just fine. So that test isn't necessary in any medical context. Um, and I was really, I think because of my fear surrounding these situations and feeling like I was already kind of a young mom, they were already treating me like, you know, I was kind of dumb and didn't really know what I was talking about. So, um, I really made sure that I was super well researched and that when I went in there, I was like using big words and talking to them the way they would talk to each other. And I wanted to like, you know, kind of demand that level of respect that like, I may not have a PhD, but I'm able to educate myself and you're not going to take control of the situation. Um, and I think that that really helped me. Like I, like I've said many times, I'm so grateful for the internet because if I hadn't been able to access that knowledge, I wouldn't, have had that confidence. Yeah. And there is so much access now to information studies and people who have been through the same, you know, same situations or similar situations that, I mean, you really can educate yourself very, very well. And it's not like, I know you, I know it's not like you wouldn't listen to what someone has to say and take their opinion and, you know, decide if it's something yeah. you want to do or not. Um, I mean, you're open-minded, but it's not like you go in there without any information. You have that opportunity now, which is awesome. Right. And I think in this situation too, like, like I said, I was naively optimistic. I honestly thought we would go into this children's hospital and they would be like, oh, you know, this was the old practice, but now we're, you know, respecting children and blah, blah, blah. Because through my research, I had found that there were countries that were, you know, like, moving towards allowing these and there was a lot of literature to support like letting these kids just be themselves and figure themselves out as they grow up um so I, I kind of expected that and I was really shocked to not have that um and I was I mean I think like you're saying, I definitely am the kind of person to listen to other people's points of view. Um, and I always like to pride myself on being able to question my own stance and opinion to like really see where my own biases and stuff lie. Um, so I really went into it really open-minded thinking we were going to have a conversation about how to best support our child. Um, because, you know, one of my fears through research was suicide and self-harm and, you know, Ori being lost and not, not feeling like they knew who they were. Um, so I knew that psychological and mental health support was also extremely important in this situation. And I felt like in my appointments with them, I was just, I was going in expecting one thing and I kind of got another and there didn't really seem to be any weight or worry at all over mental health stuff. They seem to have this attitude that, if I was fine and I reiterated to Ori they were female, it was all going to be fine. And I knew from the literature that that was the very archaic old way of doing things. And I didn't see how that could work at all. Um, you can't tell someone who they are, right? And I, I wanted to make sure that I supported my child's like mental health and well-being as well as their physical health and well-being. Um, so... Yeah, I was really glad I had access to that information and to be able to read other people's experiences and um, and to see that there were places and people that were trying to do things differently. Um, so I knew it was possible. Yeah. So, and then the history of Ori, Ori, Ori basically lived as a female, as a girl for like five years, six years. Yeah, um, I believe it was, six till the end of first grade so yeah okay. six years yeah so they um they lived as a girl till the end of first grade and then when they when they told me they felt like they were a boy um they were so adamant in it that it was like almost like an overnight switch like it wasn't really an overnight switch because they cut their hair before they said this and they were doing you know they were trying different clothes and stuff but um when they really came out about it, it was really interesting to me how they, you know, like overnight, like, I don't want any of these clothes. I want everything switched. Um, and the way they approached me with it was at bedtime when I was tucking them in, they told me, um, I feel like, you know, something went wrong when I was in your tummy and I'm supposed to be a boy. I just feel like I'm pretending to be a girl. Um, and at that time, you know, they were a year and a half into public school. Um, and so I kind of felt like, you know, 
maybe it also was because now that they were immersed in this social system where a lot of times we separate girls and boys in lines and things like that, right? It's part of the natural processes of public school. Yeah. Um, that they had sort of realized through that socialization that they didn't quite fit with the girls. They felt like they fit a little more with the boys. But then over these years, now um, about a year ago, um, they came out as feeling a little over a year ago, they came out as feeling non-binary and wanting they, them pronouns and wanting to change. They had, they were born, (laughs) we named them Oriana. Then when they were a boy, they chose their name and it was Alex. And they were Alex from the end of first grade till about a year and a half ago. And then they switched their name to Ori and they said that they felt like gender neutral pronouns fit them better and they just feel like they don't fit 100% in either category um and that's they're happy and healthy but this is where they are right now but it's been an interesting journey because I will say they were a little hyper masculine when they first transitioned to male um but then over over time I just feel like um it's really interesting to observe because I think that there is a lot that socialization and culture has to do with um you know, someone's gender identity. Like, I don't think it's all innate and and born in us. I think some of it is learned, um, at least for Ori. Some of it has been learned in the way that, you know, we always were honest with them that they were intersex. But when we raised them as a girl, we were using female pronouns. We were raising them as a girl. We weren't, you know, being neutral. Like, I know a lot of people are, which I support everyone raising their family however they see fit. But back when I was doing this, we were, you know, already going against surgery so I wasn't comfortable raising Ori without a gender because I was already worried about being judged harshly by doctors or you know government for not following their protocol Um, so I wasn't comfortable with that but now there's a lot of people doing that and I I wonder what we'll see with those kids because it's been interesting for Ori in the fact that like I said once they were socializing then they realized they didn't quite fit as a girl but before when they were just you know, preschool or play dates, I don't think they questioned it as much until they were in that standard of seeing it societally separated and labeled and, you know, genderization is alive and well in our public schools that I'm not faulting it, but it's just, it's there, right? And I think a lot of kids realize more about gender when they're at that age. Um, so it's been kind of interesting to witness from an outside perspective. And I think it's not not even just in schools. I mean, our whole culture is definitely male or female. Every time I fill out a form, I was filling out some governmental forms, and I know that's an issue going on right now. Um, and mm-hmm. it's always, are you male or female? And I always think, well, what would Ori do? Like, there's not a box here for Ori. <laughs> like, this doesn't make any sense. Right. Because I know, Ori- and it's... Um- because they they really like they and you know other intersex people it's kind of interesting obviously because some intersex people do identify as male or female but some intersex people do identify as non-binary and then there's also a whole lot of people that aren't intersex that identify as non-binary so um it really i think governmentally we are going to get to a really interesting place because I think we're going to need that third option um, because there are people that just don't fit into either or category and that's okay. And we need to make space for them. I know when I first was learning about all this stuff and realizing that, you know, the statistics on intersex people are like one in 500 to a thousand, which is statistically similar to Down syndrome or red hair. um, I try to come up with all these statistics people can think of to realize how common it is. um, But I realized that some of those comparisons aren't um you know aren't able to be grasped by all ethnicities in all parts of the world because like in Africa there aren't people with red hair so if I compare it to red hair it doesn't really make sense for people there right so we're still kind of working on the language of how to get people to understand how common it is but basically when I was learning about this I felt like there's this whole group of people that are living amongst us that are being you know, medicalized and in a lot of cases traumatized and mistreated and completely hidden. And no one knows they're there. And here we are with all of our arbitrary girl, boy, pink, blue obsession over gender and genderizing each other, each other and focusing on how different the genders are when in reality gender's on a spectrum, just like sexuality. And I was like, just sort of 
I don't, I think shocked, you know, that there was like a whole group of people being erased that nobody knew was struggling to exist within our own country. And it gave me a lot of different perspectives on things like even circumcision. And, and, you know, I was obviously enraged also because at that time when Ori in 2007, there was, when Ori was born, there was a lot of talk of FGM and how wrong that was. Um, and which obviously I agree with, you know, it's, it's awful. Um, but it just shocked me to think, well, intersex people are having genital mutilation every day in America. <laughs> and we're focusing on female genital mutilation in other countries because no one knows. And, um, you know, it just, I think it really opened up my perspective on my parenting in a lot of different ways that I didn't expect because all of a sudden respecting my children and giving them autonomy over their body took on a whole different, deeper meaning. Yeah. Um, yeah. I know. So I, know. I, I definitely like, I don't even know if I would have circumcised or not before having Ori. That's something my kids have asked. They were like, would you have circumcised if you had had a boy before Ori? And I, I like to think I wouldn't have because I had friends like you that also were doing attachment parenting and teaching me wonderful parenting philosophies. Um, but I don't know. I do think that having Ori changed my perspective on a lot of things. Yeah. So I know that we kind of get right into intersex. And I just realized that there might be people listening who really don't know what intersex is, even though it is so common. And I know you say this all the time that people have probably met and know somebody who is intersex, but don't even know that they're intersex. So right. what, what exactly is intersex? How is that different from like transgender? I know we know this, but a lot of people might not know um, know that. Yeah. Um, intersex is when someone is born with ana anatomy or biological variations that vary from the typical male or female. So basically they have different chromosomes. Like you could be a phenotypically female, but born with XY chromosomes, phenotypically male, but born with XX chromosomes, or you can have a multitude of chromosomes, XXXY, X, some people have mosaicism like Ori, which is XX and XY cells. Um, and you can have those differences on that cellular level. And you can also have those differences um, in anatomy and reproductive anatomy, um, meaning like an enlarged clitoris or testes where ovaries should be, the absence of a uterus in a woman, um, the urethra coming out of a different part of the penis rather than the tip. There's like, a, that's called hypospadias. There's a whole variety of intersex conditions that, you know, it's hard to go into all of them because like yeah. I said, there's over 40. So I definitely encourage people to do their own research. But um, basically, it's different than transgender in the fact that there is an actual um, physical difference or a biological difference in the cellular structure. So um, with someone who's transgender, they're born with typical genitalia, typical chromosomes, and um, they feel the opposite gender of what their genitalia presents. Yeah. Um, I wonder where science will go with this in the next few years and what we'll learn, because I think there, it's very interesting. Um, you know, there's like obviously some similarities in intersex and transgender experiences, um, but obviously quite a vast variety of differences as well. Um, so I'm definitely interested to see what we discover in the next few years related to like gender and the brain and stuff, because we're still learning so much about the effects in utero and, and of hormones and, um, you know, the communication between the cells and your hormone system and your androgen receptors. And um, it's really, really in interesting stuff to me. Um, but basically, intersex and trans are quite different, but there are some similarities. And yeah. there, for people that are intersex, you can be intersex and also be transgender if you have transitioned genders. And also, I'd like to add that, you know, I let I respect people choosing their own identity. So there are probably intersex people that have transitioned genders that don't call themselves trans and that's, you know, their perspective and ideology on their life and they're allowed to have whatever label they choose. Um, Ori, however, does see themselves as being intersex and trans because they've transitioned genders and they're intersex. Um, but if you're transgender, you can't develop an intersex condition or anything like that. You're born with it. So, um, so those are the basic differences. Um, yeah. so and it's transgender people usually have to, 
it, it, it's really it's really complicated when you get down to all the biology and stuff of it. Um, and transgender gender people, it's interesting in, from my own parenting perspective is that transgender people have to fight for the care they need. Um, like it's really hard sometimes to get the care they need approved with health care and whatnot. And also some, some states don't allow kids to get the hormones they want until they're 16 or 18. And for a child, you know, that's 14 that knows their gender identity, it can be kind of torture to have to delay your puberty so many years past your peers. Um, and so those those situations are are tough. We're not talking about surgical reassignment. We're just talking about hormones to let people have the puberty that um, they desire. But it can be really tough because transgender people have to fight really hard for that coverage and care, whereas intersex people have to fight to make sure they're not over medicalized and traumatized by the medical system. But they still need the medical system because when you have a unique functioning endocrine system. I mean, you need to make sure that you're getting bone density and that your hormones are okay and that you're, you know, like you do need to kind of check in and make sure that the body's okay because those hormones up until we're 30 are helping to create that bone density and whatnot. So it is important, right? Um, but it's it's kind of been my own unique perspective that I'm like, wow, this is really interesting that people over on this side are like fighting for healthcare, and then on this side, I'm like, please don't overly medicalize my child. Um, I wish we could find a little balance in that. <laughs> yeah, and I have to say, like, you are the shining example of uh, of what I think is a fearless mom. Like, not only that you didn't have any fears or questions, but the amount of information that you have gathered. And that helps to dispel so many fears and helps you to make your decisions from a place of knowledge and also from a place of gut feeling. I know some of the decisions that you made, especially early on, were ignited from a gut feeling of like, this just does not seem right. And then you go in and you find out more information. So I applaud you for that so much. Um, I mean, you know Thank so you. so much about this stuff now. It's like it's amazing, and I think um, I'm, anybody can learn a ton from you. I know I do. I've learned a ton from you over the years. Um, what do you think? What do you think was the difference that fueled you to go from a place of of fear and just like trusting the quote unquote professionals to listening to yourself and getting information in that way? Okay, got you back. All right. Um, I think um, I'm, when I'm, I'm trying to think of what gave me that like confidence to trust my gut and question authority. Um, I think that honestly, I would have to bring it back to the education and knowledge. I mean, that weekend, like my doctor's appointment with Ori, finding out that they were intersex was on a Friday. I went to Children's Hospital on a Monday. And that weekend, I don't even know how much I slept because I was so immersed in reading everything I could get my hands on. And um, because of you know the internet, I was able to find out through my research that a lot of the treatment of intersex people had been founded on the basis of a psychologist um, from Dr. John Hopkins, whose name was Dr. Money. Um, I believe James Mooney or money. Um, I'll have to look it up for you. But um, basically he had, there had been a botched circumcision with twin boys and um, they had decided to just raise one as a girl and to just totally do surgery on them and have the family female gender them and just cover up this mistake by just showing that uh, nurture could overpower nature. Um, so the whole basis of the treatment of intersex people was founded on this, that you could nurture someone into a specific gender and that intersex people just needed to be boxed into a gender and nurtured and that there wouldn't be a problem. Um, and so basically what I found from my research was that uh, his case wasn't successful. The 
person that he did this to, his name was David Reimer, R-E-I-M-E-R, David Reimer, Reimer, I'm not sure how you pronounce that. But anyways, he, he was, it wasn't successful. He grew up to transition to being a boy. He, he didn't feel female. That never stuck. He had so many mental health and psychological issues from basically the torture he was put through as someone was, you know, I mean, they took him to psychologists and it wasn't just the family telling him what gender it was. It was forced upon him by the doctors as well um, through play therapy and different things. So he struggled so much psychologically that he eventually committed suicide. So when I was able to research and find that so much of the basis of how they had treated intersex people in the medical establishment was based on this psychologist and his case, which was actually not successful at all. It was awful. Um, I think that it made me feel empowered in the ability of being able to question them because all of a sudden I was like oh wow the entire basis of why they're doing this stuff is rooted in this and if they're not able to assess that and stay with me we want to move forward with treating intersex people better blah 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 then this then I don't know what I'm going to do <laughs> because they're you know like I felt um I felt empowered to question them because of this information I honestly feel like without that information I don't know if I would have felt empowered and I also tried to think from the perspective of an intersex person um you know like like any mother would try to think from their child's perspective and all I could imagine was that if I was intersex and if my family had done surgery on me then I might feel confused about my gender because the choice was taken from me and I may want the opposite simply because you didn't let me have a choice in the matter because a lot of people have a contrarian streak or contrarian nature right especially through adolescence um, and I just felt like it wasn't my choice to make and the risk of messing them up emotionally or psychologically was so great that I didn't care how much the doctors or other people judged me that like I knew I couldn't do anything to risk that because all these surgical decisions could be made later if, if Ori wanted them that there was no immediate risk that immediate choice that needed to, needed to happen right at the moment yeah. Yeah. um yeah, and but I think that that ability to put myself in someone else's shoes probably helped, but I wouldn't have been able to put myself in someone else's shoes if I hadn't been able to read their their lived experience, if I hadn't been able to find that information. Yeah. Um, so I think that knowledge is really what gave me that confidence. And I think just the the fact that you reached out for that knowledge and didn't just wait until Monday to see what the doctors had to say is shows that you have you know, you have a gut instinct that all moms have, but you listen to your gut instinct and you already had a little bit of different paradigm. I knew you back then. So <laughs> I knew you like you were having right. your babies and you know, birth centers. You were more of an attachment parent lifestyle. You valued your children. I was, feelings yeah, and I was thoughts. the first person in my family to, I was the first person in my family to breastfeed for like at least the last few generations that I've ever known <laughs> I was the first person to like natural birth like it was definitely I was okay with paving my own way yeah um like clearly I was okay with that and I definitely felt like I think any mom feels this way like you know I I knew something was different about Ori like I think we have those instincts just like you're saying the gut feeling um, and I sort of just felt, you know, that, that innate mom thing that we all feel that I have to protect them. I have to make sure that they're okay. And, you know, like from my perspective, from research, um, you know, there's a lot of people that have felt, uh, psychologically sexually abused by doctors in these situations because there's so much focus on the child's genitals. I mean, we're talking about every time they go to the doctor, every six months, there's a genital exam, sometimes in stirrups. And we're talking about children. And so this is, you know, it was really hard for me to take in that information. And I was so appalled because I thought with the psychological knowledge that we have nowadays, how in the hell is anybody justifying, you know, this sort of treatment of children um, when they can't comprehend what you're talking about or why it matters? And does it really matter when they're a child? Do you really need to see how their genitals grow just because they're atypical? No, you don't. Um, so I think it was in that way, I was able just 
like I said before, I was able to research and know that I had to empower Ori. And part of that empowerment was to prevent them from undergoing trauma. Um, and I mean, it was obviously awkward because I don't think anyone should ever have to advocate to a doctor to not do genital exams on their child. I think that it's probably really strange for people to think that this is how some people's parenting experience is and how their child's life is. I know that I never would have thought of it before having an intersex child myself. I don't think I ever would have expected that these sorts of things were even going on, right? Because it sounds ludicrous that I should even have to advocate yeah. for that. Yeah. And so I know you have to run because you have some kids to pick up at school. So um, yes, I do. <laughs> so really quickly at the end here, I just want to know what what you're doing now because you're part of the you and Ori because Ori you waited till Ori decided that they wanted to be part of activism with intersex. Um, so what are you guys doing now, and what kind of ways can people support you? Um, well, right now, um, we've been talking to interact a couple times over the last month. Um, we're in the process of figuring out how we can set up a petition in Washington state to give um, intersex children the right to bodily autonomy, at least within our state. We're kind of hoping that maybe people can do this state by state um, and get these kids some bodily autonomy so that they can stop going through unnecessary uh, surgery. and. Um, other ways you can support us are by going to Interact site. Interact is an intersex activist group, I-N-T-E-R-A-C-T, and they're all over social media and they have a website. And they do a lot of education. If you go to their website, there's tons of PDFs and information you can download and share. And if you're a teacher, there's resources and all kinds of stuff there if you're a medical professional. Um, and Interact helps intersex youth and is an activist, you know, is a, an amazing organization. I would encourage people to look them up and learn more about them. Um, and they're, they are the ones that we're talking to and trying to get help from with regards to our own state. And they're very excited about helping us with this process. Um, and then there's also Pigeon, Pigonis, Pidge, Pigeon, I think at Pigeon is like all their handles on social media. Um, and they have YouTube videos. They're an amazing intersex activist that uh, has done so much for intersex people and shares their stories so vulnerably. And um, they're a close friend of ours. We consider them part of our family. Um, so those are a couple ways you can support intersex people. Obviously, you can follow me on Facebook or at Flexitarian Sam on Instagram. And Ori is at my intersex story. Um, so you can follow us and support us that way. Um, I am in the new year going to be launching um, to be doing pu paid public speaking. I've been doing a lot of things unpaid within my own community at like Swedish Medical Center and the Bellingham Birth Center um, with midwives and stuff. Um, but I'm hoping to um, be able to do some paid work so we can maintain the activism and all the things that we're doing. Um, so we hope to basically, our biggest goal is to try to see the surgeries end. We want to see legislation. We don't want to just see people following people and excited on social media. Like that's great because it can be an avenue for sharing awareness and education, which I love. Um, but I really, really want to see some true legitimate change. So that's why we're trying to get this petition going. And we're hoping if we get the petition going within the next few months, that it would be on the next ballot. Um, and I think things like that are really important to me because I view this and so does Ori as like a human rights issue, a human rights violation that these children are going through. And the United Nations views it that way. It's it's being talked about a lot more globally. Um, so I would really like to see some true legitimate legislative change that acknowledges intersex people and gives them autonomy and protection over their infant bodies. Cool. Well, you are doing an amazing job and I have admired you as a mom and a friend for a very long time now. Um, I will make sure that those get, links get placed in our show notes and people can contact me if they want any information as well. And I will try to find them the right, right place to go. So thank you, Christina. And at the end to add. Um, no, I just want to thank you. Um, I feel like a lot of my friends that I've known from this whole time, you know, your friend, you're, you're always sentimental about your friends that you've had for a really long time. But I feel like um, 
I don't know if you actually know like how instrumental and helpful you were during that time of our life, but you know, um, at that time I didn't have as much knowledge as I do now and having a friend like you that was so educated in the body and that was already, um, so confident in their parenting and the way they were living their life. That was really, it was, it was immensely helpful to me as a person and as a parent. And I learned so much about attachment parenting and and things like that from you. And a lot of how I parent and have lived my life with my kids is so different than how I was raised. And I attribute a lot of that to the amazing friends that I had like you and Aloisa and Corley. And I have all these amazing friends that I'm so grateful for that have been such a, a shining example to me that we've all shared information with each other. And I mean, I remember talking to you endlessly when I was trying to make these decisions and you were always so supportive and telling me to trust my gut. And um, I just, I'm really grateful for you and I hope you know that. (laughs) Thank you very much. I am just going to make me cry. (laughs) Well, thank you very much for coming on and we hope that we get an end to these unnecessary surgery so these kids can just be themselves and be amazing and maybe sometime soon we'll have orion to share all of it definitely and they are oh, so or you cannot wait to talk <laughs> to you and i'm i'm sure that they'll like also be distracting a little bit to talk about some latest toy or gadget or whatever <laughs> but they, they already told me i can't wait to talk to cheryl oh, i love you guys all right well, we'll have a good day we love you too go get have your a kids. fabulous day okay bye. thanks bye thank you for joining us on the fearless family health podcast If you like what you hear and want to hear more, please subscribe to upcoming casts and rate us on iTunes. Also, don't forget to share it with your friends so we can all be fearless.